What I love about AI and the way that it operates right now is the fact that it is unpredictable. There's emergent behavior in our cognitively capable artificial systems that we can certainly model, but we don't encode directly. And that's a, a key difference. So we like to say, oh, pff, of course, this is not really intelligent because we coded it up. Mm -hmm. And we've just put in these little parameters there and there's like, you know, about six billion parameters. And once you've learned them, you know, we kind of understand the layers. But that's an oversimplification. It's, it's like saying, oh, of course, pff, humans, we understand humans. They're just made out of neurons and, you know, layers of cortex and there's a visual uh, area and there's a, but, but every human is encoded by a ridiculously small number of genes compared to the complexity of our cognitive apparatus. 20,000 genes is really not that much, out of which a tiny little fraction are in fact encoding all of our cognitive functions. The rest is emergent behavior. The rest is the, you know, the, the, the cortical layers doing their thing mm -hmm. in the same way that when we build, you know, these conversational systems or these cognitive systems or these deep learning systems, we put the architecture in place, but then they do their thing. And in some ways that's creating something that has its own identity. That's creating something that's not just Oh yeah, it's not the, the early AI where if you hadn't programmed what happens in the grocery bags when you have both cold and hot and hard and soft, mm -hmm. you know, the system wouldn't know what to do. No, no, you basically now just pro program the primitives and then it learns from that. So even though the origins are humble, just like it is for our genetic code uh, for AI, even though the origins are humble, the, the, uh, the, the result of it being deployed into the world is infinitely complex. And that's, and yet there's not, uh, it's not yet able to be cognizant of all the other layers in, uh, uh, of its, you know, it's not, uh, it's not able to think about uh, space and time. It's not able to think about the hardware on which it runs, the electricity on which it runs yet. So, so if you look at humans, we basically have the same cognitive architecture as monkeys, as the great apes. It's just a ton more of it. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, GPT-3 mm -hmm. versus GPT-2, again, it's the same architecture, just more of it. And yet it's able to do so much more. Yeah. So if you start thinking about sort of what's the future of that, GPT-4 and GPT-5, do you really need fundamentally different architectures or do you just need a ton more hardware? And we do have, a ton more hardware. Like these systems are nowhere near what humans have between our ears. So, uh, you know, there's something to be said about stay tuned for emergent behavior. We keep thinking that general intelligence might just be forever away, but it could just simply be that we just need a ton more hardware and that humans are just not that different from the great apes except for just a ton more of it. Yeah, it's it's interesting that in the AI community, maybe it is a human-centric fear, but the notion that GPT-10 will be, uh, will achieve general intelligence is something that people shy away from, that there has to be something totally different and new added to this. And yet it's not seriously considered that um, this, this very simple, thing, this very simple architecture when scaled might be the thing that achieves superintelligence. And people think the same way about humanity and human consciousness. They're like, oh, consciousness might be quantum or it might be, you know, some, some yeah. non-physical thing. Yeah. And it's like, or it could just be a lot more of the same hardware that now is sufficiently capable of self-awareness just because it has the neurons to do it. So maybe the consciousness that is so elusive is an emergent behavior of you basically string together all these cognitive capabilities that come from running, from seeing, from reacting, from predicting the movement of a fly as you're catching it through the air. All of these things are just like great lookup tables encoded in a giant neural network. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, of course, the complexity and the diversity of the different types of excitatory inhibitory neurons, the waveforms that sort of shine through the, 
you know, the, the, the connections across all these different layers, the amalgamation of signals, etc. The brain is enormously complex. I mean, of course. But again, it's a small number of primitives encoded by a tiny number of genes which are self-organized and shaped by their environment. Babies that are growing up today are listening to language from conception. Basically, as soon as the auditory apparatus forms, it's already getting shaped to the types of signals that are out in the real world today. So it's not just like, oh, have an Egyptian be born and then ship them over. It's like, no, that, that Egyptian would be listening in to the complex of the world and then getting born and sort of seeing just how much more complex the world is. So it's a combination of the underlying hardware, which if you think about as a geneticist, in my view, the hardware gives you an upper bound of cognitive capabilities, but it's the environment that makes those capabilities shine and reach their maximum. So we're a combination of nature and nurture. The nature is our genes and our cognitive apparatus, and the nurture is the richness of the environment that makes that cognitive apparatus reach its potential. And we are so far from reaching our full potential, so far. I think that kids being born a hundred years from now, they'll be looking at, at us now and saying what primitive educational systems they had. I can't believe people were not wired into this, <laughs> you know, virtual reality from birth as we are now, because like they're clearly inferior and so on and so forth. So I, I basically I think that our environment will continue exploding and our cognitive capabilities. It's not like, oh, we're only using 10% of our brain. That's ridiculous. Of course, we're using 100% of our brain, but it's still constrained by how complex our environment is. So the hardware will remain the same, but the software in a quickly advancing environment, the software will make a huge difference in the nature of like the human experience, the human condition. It's fascinating to think that humans will look very different a hundred years from now just because the environment changed. Even though we're still the same great apes, the the descendant of apes, 